Hi, I'm here on behalf of Youngry. I'm with Andrew Thomas from Skyball. Um, Andrew, the first question I want to ask you is, can you tell me about this Indiegogo story that I've heard so much about? Yeah, so we got started on Indiegogo three and a half years ago uh, for an idea of a video doorbell that you could answer from your phone. So whether you're home or you're away, uh, we wanted to give customers the ability to see who's at their door from their phone. And we looked around, the idea didn't exist, and we went for to get funny. And nobody really wanted to fund this group of people that wanted to reinvent the doorbell. Right. So we took it to Indiegogo, and in about 30 days, we raised just under $600,000. $600,000 in 30 days. Was there any secret sauce, or was there uh, any great marketing effort, or was this just a great idea? You know, we kind of did everything wrong as, as we ended up <laughs> learning. And they're like, don't launch on a Saturday, don't do it in August. And, we launched on a Saturday in August. <laughs> uh, we didn't know, but I mean, that's kind of the thing is you can't time everything perfectly. So sometimes you just gotta go and launch with stuff. But the reason I think that campaign was successful was the idea itself. We have a good idea that people resonated with very quickly. Um, you know, you just say, see who's at your door from your phone. People can interpret the value in their own lives that that product provides. So it's a very easy story to tell, but I think for you know other entrepreneurs, it's all about the video got to have a compelling video, you got to tell your visitors why they should care, um, how they're going to benefit, and you got to do it quickly. So in 30 seconds, you better have the value proposition out, and then you give all the other details. Got it. Yeah. So is there a reason you chose Indiegogo over Kickstarter for anyone that might be interested in crowdfunding? Yeah, so you've got crowd, crowdfunding, you've got Kickstarter, you've got Indiegogo. We chose Indiegogo because they have something called flux funding. So if you want to raise $100,000 and you, you raise $99,999 um, on Kickstarter, you get zero. Okay. Uh, on Indiegogo, you get $99,999. So that was a big one. Um, it just seemed like, you know, it was the right spot for us. And it ended up, we were right. It was, they're a great company, great community that they built. So if I did it again, I would, I would choose Indiegogo. Got it. And where is Skybell at currently? So currently we have grown uh, to about 28 people. Um, we are, gosh, I mean, it's been three and a half years since our Indiegogo campaign, uh, which is crazy, but um, you know, we're partnering with some of the best companies in the world now. Honeywell, Alarm.com, Comcast, Xfinity Home, um, Nest. It just, it's just amazing to think that in three and a half years we've gone from you know, this idea to this company um, that is actually helping customers prevent robberies at their front door because they can talk to burglars at their front door, right? Or they can keep uh, packages safe. Um, it, it's just been incredible. So we're we're definitely in our growth stage right now. Um, it's nice to see kind of sales really picking up, but um, it's been a heck of a journey. That's awesome. So you mentioned you just partnered with a bunch of strategic partnerships, basically companies. Would you say that that had a big impact on Skybell's success, the hockey stick that you're speaking of, as far as partnering with those types of companies? Absolutely. Yeah. Both in terms of you know, some of those partners, once you you tell people you're partnered with them, they carry weight with them. And mm -hmm. Our product was able to clear quality assurance with these companies, which is a big deal. So it kind of validates the idea, it validates the quality of our product, um, but there's also you know a distribution model there. There's there's units involved, so it's a great way to kind of kind of achieve a couple things while also moving units, which is you know, the goal, right? right? So it's been good. Do you have um, a Skybell on hand that you can show the audience? I do actually. Awesome. So this is what we Take us through. invented and created. It's a video doorbell, and it replaces your current doorbell. And when someone comes up to the door and they press this button the video camera activates and it sends live HD video to your smartphone. At that time you can see who's at your door and you can actually talk to them. So say who's there and we have a speaker and a microphone on this device and out comes your voice and you can talk to them. So you can positively identify who's at your door and you can do this whether you're at home on the couch and you're watching the game or you're reading a book you just don't want to get the door or you can know who's coming to your door when you're gone and statistics show that you're more likely to get, um, your house is likely to get burglarized during the day. And a burglar goes up to your front door, they press the button. They want to know if you're home. So with Skyboy, you can actually pretend to be home even when you're not. They don't know the difference. So it's been incredible. That's incredible. Um, literally incredible. It seems like one of those products where you can't believe it doesn't exist already. Yeah. Um, are there any more iterations you can make with the product to make it more technologically sound as time goes on? or is this is Skyball, the ultimate form right now. 
It's definitely not the ultimate form. I mean, this is one version. We started with a circular device, and that was great, but some people didn't have the space for it in their home. And so we had to get feedback from our users in our community, and some said, uh, there's not enough room for this circle one. It's like the size of a hockey puck. Yeah. So we ended up making this version. This is like the second variant. This fits on door trim, mm -hmm. for when doorbells are on door frames. So there's this one. We have a battery-powered version coming out, and then those are the doorbells, and then we'll have some other complementary products that come out. But you know, the thing we learned in our Indiegogo campaign early was that users have a voice, and there's usually good reasons why they want something. And in Indiegogo, we got almost a thousand emails about what customers wanted, how they wanted it, what they didn't want. And so all we did is just check off what they wanted, what they didn't. Mm -hmm. And so we're still doing it. People are like, I want a battery version because I don't have wired power. I need it to fit in this frame. And we listen to our partners. We're really just a, you know, go to our constituents, tell me what you want. Yeah. And then we, we adjust and we make it. You're good at surveying the crowd. That's right. Out the next iteration. That's, That's awesome. right. I could see a solar powered version at some point, like mm -hmm. everything else has to be solar powered with yeah. your home. Um, so is this the first venture that you really had success with or were you in the entrepreneurial phase before this as well? I've been an entrepreneur, but I've never had a high growth you know, tech startup before. So. I was in SEO and online marketing prior, um, and I had been affiliated with a company that was making GPS trackers that, uh, this is like six or seven years ago, that people would use to give their kids, put it in their backpack, you could track them through mm -hmm. the app, and so that's where I got my first look at a tech startup, and it was something I really wanted to do, and then when we started the doorbell, um, the Skybell, we, uh, yeah, that was an opportunity for me to become an actual founder. Right. So this was the first time, you know, where your sweat equity is on the line. You don't get paid for, you know, 15 months, and um, you just kind of do the do. And uh, this is this is the first one, so it's been it's been good. So, out of all that, besides the Indiegogo story, are there any stories that you can tell the audience about what it was like to take uh, a company from idea to the original conception all the way through the hockey stick growth profitability, the 600000 on Indiegogo. Is there a story that you can tell a hopeful entrepreneur out there that is wanting to start a startup and is willing to put sweat equity on the line? Yeah, it, I mean, there's, <laughs> there's millions, right? <laughs> Maybe just one that stands out. <laughs> one that stands out. So, I mean, that's kind of the point is that entrepreneurship is millions of moments. Mm -hmm. And a lot of those moments are good and a lot of them are bad and you swing oftentimes you swing during the day like I always tell people you wake up optimistic that those there's, there's no way you'll fail and you go to bed thinking that there's no way you're ever going to succeed like that is start and it, and it plays with your mind and you have to be ready for that and you can have a great idea and you can have the people around you and you can hustle and listen to Gary Vaynerchuk and hustle till you're you got no fingernails left and just claw, right? It's his message, but his message, I think, is more about like the self-awareness. You got to get right with yourself and right with your mindset so that you can handle these swings. You got to know: Are you an entrepreneur? Are you ready? You know, you're going to go high to low super fast. So there's been high moments. The highs have been when we were included in an Apple HomeKit announcement when we were like nine months old and no one knew who we were. You're just like, how how is this happening? And you know, lows is, is when you don't get a deal. Uh, the lows are when, you know, you have a partner and they tell you that, you know, your product development's too slow and you're not going out in a first launch or you're not going out at all. Um, these things happen. And I think, um, you know, one of those moments where you're like, are we gonna make it? Uh, you know, should I quit? Like, that's like every couple months. So, I mean, it's all the time. Was there one low, like rock bottom moment that you can remember? Because there are a lot of entrepreneurs out there who don't succeed right away. Um, and it doesn't have to be a specific story, but yeah. maybe just an example of something where you kind of hit that bottom point where you need to keep climbing yeah. to get out of. So, absolutely. When we launched our first version of the product, it wasn't very good, mm -hmm. to be perfectly candid. Um, and so it was, it was Indiegogo back, right? It was, um, we raised $600,000 and we made a, a Wi-Fi enabled video doorbell mm -hmm. um, that goes to the cloud, find your phone. Like this is a complicated product with 600 grand and we did it in four months. So it wasn't perfect. And when we launched that, 
people were brutal. I was not ready and mentally prepared for how much backlash we were going to get from our customers. And these were people who we thought this, like supported crowdfunding because they wanted to support us as we invented the product and brought it to market. And they were going to be patient and understanding, and they weren't. It was like, this is not as good as my iPhone. <laughs> like, well, your iPhone costs eight hundred dollars. <laughs> you know, this is a hundred twenty-five dollar video doorbell. That that's how much these people paid to back us, and we're super appreciative. But I wasn't ready for the backlash. And there were times where the inbox was so full with complaints. People people called the cops on us. Like they came to our office to find out if we were real or or a scam. Um, people found out like who was in my family, like my cousins, like Facebook and other means. It was. It was, it was stressful. Our product wasn't ready to go. And so um, we ended up, I looked at my co-founder, Greg, and, and I said, dude, do you want to bail water or do you want to just wrap this thing up and try to get out? And uh, we both looked at each other. We knew what the answer was. Yeah. The answer is fight, yeah. right? And so we did. And so he and I and our other co-founders just picked up the phone and called everybody. Like if people had complaints, we were calling them. So we did our regular job and then we did this customer service Call job. Center. We got on the phone with ourselves. We, I heard more F-bombs in those couple weeks than I did like my entire sports career. You know, it's <laughs> like it, people were pissed. But, and, that, and that's a point where you're like, maybe I'm not good at this. Mm -hmm. Maybe luck's not on my side. Maybe this just isn't going to happen. And that's when doubt comes in. But you, you just have to keep going. You know, at some point, it's just like put one foot in front of the other and keep going. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, and then to go off of that, obviously you've had an amazing entrepreneurial ride. I think you've been at this for three, four years with Sky Alone. Sky, oh, yeah. yeah, Sky Doll Alone. Um, so with that being said, in that entire journey, what is the one piece of advice that you would give to the entrepreneurs that might be listening out there? Because as you said, you know, it, it's an up and down period, and there are some times where you have to pivot, wear different hats, make the call center, um, entire system work. Yeah. So what's that one bit of advice that you'd give to someone that's tuning in right now and listening for that piece of advice? Yeah, you know, there's a ton of advice, and I think there's so much good advice, right, like Gary Vaynerchuk, and I mean, there's just so many good, Brad Feld. Um, but what I would say is what's helped me personally is detaching. Um, from the experience as much as you can. And this is maybe a little more mindful and a little more philosophical, but uh, when you realize that you aren't your startup, that's when you know you can be happy. Um, your startup is an expression of your creative power. It is not you. So when it's not going well, it doesn't mean like you aren't worthy or you aren't smart or whatever. And when you take the meaning of your startup and you apply it to yourself, that's when you know things start happening. And you've got to be you know, right-minded, you've got to be in the middle, you've got to be grounded when stuff's going bad, because usually it's not going as bad as you think, mm -hmm. right? And so you got to have your wits about you during those times, and so uh, I think detaching kind of from that identity and also realizing that some of the things that happened that were bad and that would, you know, cause this anxiety weren't actually as bad as I thought. Mm -hmm. So to have the awareness of what's going on, to have people around you like mentors and advisors and people who've been through it before, you know, to help you understand that you know the next call isn't life or death. And when you detach from it, then you can get on that call and like be free to maneuver. But if you're like tense and, and clenched and so worried, you can't make the most of a phone call or a meeting or in a, you know any given moment. So I'd say detaching, like you got to get right with your mind to to, to make this to make this work. Yeah. And I think that's a great idea and <laughs> definitely necessary. Um, with that being said, you just brought up mentors and advisors being mm -hmm. a big part of this. Were there any specific mentors and advisors or any advice? Or I, I'd even throw in um, Lorenzo's favorite question here is any books? Were there any books. books, any advisors, or any advice that stuck out that really helped you? Yeah. Tons of books, but the biggest book, uh, How to Win Friends and Influence People by yeah, Dale Carnegie. Carnegie. My brother told me that Warren Buffett read that thing 15 times, so I've been on a mission to read it 15 times, um, and I'm on like 14 and a half right now. Yeah, love it. Uh, so fantastic. Um, there's another book called Crucial Conversations that is also really good about interpersonal um, tactics and, and conversations being likable. Um, I've had so many different mentors. And I look at mentors as uh, you got to have one for each part of your life. I've got one that I work with on mindfulness and, you know, it helps me spiritually. Um, I've got one 
that um, you know, before I came became an entrepreneur, I started to kind of get in biohacking a bit, mm -hmm. like the Dave Asprey and a, a bulletproof exec stuff. But um, he was an army ranger, former army ranger. So we overhauled like my diet, my workouts. I was able to get like twice as effective workouts. Um, in instead of working three times a, a week for one hour, I was doing like three times a week for 40 minutes. Wow. And it just got ripped and just felt so powerful. We overhauled my diet. That helps your cognition. Mm -hmm. I went from working like eight hours a day to being able to crank out 15 hours a day easy, like seven days a week. Wow. Um, and so that was a really good experience. Um, the best advice I got from any one mentor is when I was 24, 23, 24, and I'm 32 now, mm -hmm. Um, my mentor told me that he's like the money that you're gonna use to, to make your big um, you know your big win your big hit isn't the money that you have in that moment and he's like keep playing your hands like keep chips on the table that's all you need to do like don't worry that you don't have this big you know ton of money just keep putting chips on the table keep playing little games mm -hmm. and just stick around and he's like you're gonna grow and you're gonna grow and then you're gonna be in a position where you can really make move, moves. Or, and I interpreted that, the way that played out is when we needed to not make money for 12 months, I wasn't sweating because right. I had been saving, I had been keeping my chips on the table mm -hmm. and I wasn't like sweating it. And I was well positioned so that when Skybell hit, I could work for 12 months and not sweat it mm -hmm. without getting paid. And like that ends up being the money that I'm gonna end up making this victory with and this hit. So, you know, people get, get lost in that game. All I need to do is just keep playing hands as, as he said. So um, that was good advice. You know, that's really the, the stand-up you know, business advice. So um, that particular mentor, every time I call him and tell him some mistake happened or we got burned or throughout my entrepreneurial career, mm -hmm. he's always like, perfect. Like if I got ripped off by somebody or a deal went south, he'd be like, oh, it's a, who cares that you lost $10,000? At least you didn't keep doing business with them and lose 100000 Yeah. And he always looked at things like that, and you're like, wow, okay, $10,000 lesson, like, perfect. <laughs> yeah, done. That's going to save me a hundred grand yeah. in some amount of time. So your failures are your, your successes, and it's just a way of looking at it, That's right? That's a very positive way to look at it. Yeah. yeah. You've brought up mindfulness a couple times now. Um, can you speak to what that means to you as far as the spirituality and how that uh, how entrepreneurs should really align themselves with that concept as well to grow? as well as in their business. Yeah, so I believe that your ability to be a good person allows you to be a good founder. And um, I, I believe in that, you know, when your mind's right, your body's right, your spirit's all aligned, like that's when really good stuff happens. And so mindfulness to me is, is more about, you know, understanding that, that you are, you know, on some level removed from all of this. Um, when you realize that you are part of the universe, when you realize that you are made of energy, and you have this inherent, you know, you're part of the universe, right? You're bigger than, than, than just your startup, or you, or the person you're negotiating with. You, you get this like non-attachment. It's not detachment, it's a non-attachment. And it reduces your fear. It reduces the anxiety that you experience. And so for me, like, tw like five years ago, when I was about 25, 26, I was very anxious. Um, I hated what I was doing. Um, my life just wasn't good. It was in a negative spot. And I turned it all around through the power of positive thought, meditation, and studying mindfulness, Taoism, and all these sorts of things. And what I learned is that I was attaching to too many meanings. Like, I am a failure if blank happens. I am a, a smart person if Y happens. And it, it, when you let go of those attachment to meanings, you lose fear. Because if you're... Like I was very merit driven, so I needed to achieve to feel worthy or feel good about myself. Mm -hmm. Well, if I didn't achieve, then that was a reflection on me as a person. But that shouldn't happen. And when you cut that connection, you say, this failure is an experience. It's just what happened. Mm -hmm. It has no reflection on me. Then you're free to like really make maneuvers in your life. You're not scared about taking chances. You're not scared about making a video doorbell company that fails and you know, my face was on crowdfunding on Indiegogo. If Skybell failed, it was going to be all me. <laughs> like all my co-founders are hanging out like behind the couch. Like they're not in front <laughs> of the camera. No one knows. When you remove that fear, like you get to do anything in your life. You get to walk into like your creative power, your creative freedom. So that's what it's about. It's about like for me, the way it materializes. I'll give you an example: is we negotiated against uh, a company, and they tried to use their size and their power against us. And 
you know, someone said, how did you negotiate that deal? And I said, you know, it boils down to the realization that there's nothing that they can really do to harm me. Like, they can not close a deal with us and Skybell could fail, but at the end of the day, what does that do to me as a person? Mm -hmm. Really nothing. Like, I'll go start another company. I'll start an online business. I'll start a personal brand. I'll go travel the world for 12 months. Like, there's <laughs> nothing that it really, at the end of the day, is going to do to harm me as a person. It's tough to beat that. Right? Yeah. So when you go and you have that, you can tell people, no. <laughs> right? You don't have to feel like you're pressured to do a, do a bad deal. You can say no. Mm -hmm. And if they say no and they walk away, someone else is going to come, someone else will pop. Like, so it's all about fear. It's getting rid of the fears that keep you from making bad decisions or coming from a mindset of lack instead of a mindset of opportunity. Mm -hmm. Right? So, I don't know, that was probably like the worst way of answering it. Did that I think, make any sense? I think those are life lessons. <laughs> those are some serious life okay. lessons. <laughs> oh, man. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's that's kind of what it's all about. But I think you got to be a good person. You got to be um, you got to be have a sense of mindfulness and a sense of awareness, right? Mm -hmm. um, and you do have to work hard. And the the other thing that I would, if this is advice, is I call it magic. Mm -hmm. Cultivate your magic, especially when you're young. Your advantage when you're young is you can, like, if you're 23, you can go walk up to anybody. And, and they'll love it because it's like, oh, look at this ambitious 23-year-old. Like, yeah. they'll do anything for you. Right. Like, make introductions. Meet people. Don't be scared to just get out there. Create magic. Magic is like you and I have now met, right? Mm -hmm. And if I need something in my life, like, you might be the person to intro. You can call right? it. <laughs> That's right. That's it. You got my back. But, like, magic's like connections. Mm -hmm. And it helps you accelerate your growth. Like, the more people you know and the more favorable that they feel when they think about you, you're gonna you're gonna move faster than the person that tries to do it on their own. Yeah. It isn't making connections, it isn't making meaningful relationships. So pump the magic, you know. Pump Make magic. time for magic. I wish I had done more of that when I was 25, 26. Yeah. And the last question I have for you is obviously given kind of a blueprint for aligning mindfulness with your actual business life. And mm -hmm. you, you've illustrated that when you're at peace as far as not having fear, being ambitious, going out, creating that magic you really align yourself for success. Mm -hmm. That's a lot to do overnight. Is mm -hmm. there uh, an actionable, maybe first step, maybe first couple steps that you could give to the entrepreneurs that are tuning in right now, um, how they can begin this process? What's yeah. the first step? So if you want to add a little mindfulness, um, I would read um, or, or get an audio book called Making Your Thoughts Work For You mm -hmm. uh, by Dr. Wayne Dyer. Like He's that. got great stuff. Like, just start reading a little bit. Like, let your curiosity come alive. So, read a little bit of Law of Attraction stuff. Um, you know, the other um, you, you, TED Talks are a great way to do it. So, when I was making this sort of transformation, for lack of a better word, um, TED Talks from Matthew Ricard were big. Brenny Brown, mm -hmm. um, Simon Sinek, uh, Sean Acor. Those are all good TED Talks to listen to. Um, and who else was big? Uh, you know, I like I like um, Gary Vaynerchuk for the message of you do need to work hard and you do need to make sacrifices. Mm -hmm. But his message for me is really about self awareness. He says, make sure you're an entrepreneur. Make sure this is your path. Like just because I want to go be in the NBA doesn't mean I can. Like you gotta have a sense of awareness about your strengths and your desires, and they'll find the alignment. So I like his message for that reason. Doesn't matter how hard you try to make the NBA if you're five foot two and can't jump. Yeah, it's, it's tough. <laughs> it's most likely not going right, to happen, right. Yeah. right? And that's just a reality of things. But um, that book is, you know, I I read stuff like even Bruce Lee. Like we all think of him as the martial arts movie guy. He's mm -hmm. like a great philosopher. So I read the Tao of uh, the Tao Te Ching. Um, that's a great book, but. The simpler book for that one is called The Tao of Pooh, T-A-O, The Tao of Pooh. It talks about how Winnie the Pooh is this quintessential Taoist um, metaphor, basically. And, and a good example is if there's an episode where they ask all the characters what their favorite day is. Mm. And, and Tigger's like, oh, Friday. And Rabbit's like, Tuesday. I was like, Monday. And Winnie the Pooh says, today. Love it. Right? <laughs> He's just in the moment. Yeah. And so... Um, I think that those are good ways to start, though. Podcasts are such a great tool. Like, I listen to so many different people, from Tim Ferriss. You know, I listen to industry podcasts. Um, Medium is great. 
Uh, there's an article called, um, it's called The Intersection Between Should and Must mm -hmm. by L. Luna. That is a must read for any entrepreneur. And there's a Medium blog post. You don't have to get a book. You can just read the Medium blog post. And it's so good. It's about what should you do versus like what must you do. Mm -hmm. and, and great entrepreneurs follow the must. The must is like what you would do whether or not you got paid. Right? It's like Picasso painting even though nobody cared. Yeah. Right? That's the must. And that's a good message too. So. All right. That was jam-packed with information. Good yeah. stuff. Um, thank you so much for your time. Yeah, Great absolutely. to meet you officially. Yeah, good to be here. Thank you.